Welcome to IdeaGen TV Live from Washington, D.C., here today with Jake Sotiriadis, Chief of the Strategic Foresight Air Force Futures. Jake, welcome. George, it's great to be with you again. Good welcome. to see you. Wow. Great to be here in yeah, person. In person. In person in Washington. It's such an exciting moment to have you here for a lot of reasons. We, first of all, want to thank you for your service to the United States of America for keeping our democracy intact and for all the work you're doing to look at the future. That's what we'll be talking about today, the future. And so you have a very unique job. You're a global futurist. Jake, what inspired you? What inspired you to become a global futurist? That's a great question, George, and thank you for asking. And again, it's, it's such a pleasure to be with you all. Um, to be honest, a lot of it lies in my love of history. Uh, sometimes there's a, we like to say that futurists are uh, closet historians because they like to make the connections of history, the lessons of history, the insights from the past, to be able to understand what's different today and what will be different about tomorrow. And so we can do that by innovating from the future. And so uh, my background in military intelligence, working with things like unmanned aerial vehicles and traditional intelligence functions and a lot of strategic analysis portfolios here in, in Washington at the Pentagon, I think all really were, were critical in, in sort of building that up. Um, and then I had an opportunity uh, to, to study at the University of Hawaii. And for the folks who are listening, they may not know, but the University of Hawaii is uh, really one of the global leaders in strategic foresight or future studies. And so I had a chance to be a, a research fellow there at the Research Center for Future Studies. And so when I came back to Washington, uh, it was just sort of a natural connection to be able to uh, bring that capability to the Air Force. Uh, and so it's almost a, uh, if you will, maybe an entrepreneur type uh, move that we were able to do because the capability we brought to the table didn't exist before 2019. Uh, and so doing that, I think, really uh, set us in a good place for when the pandemic hit in 2020. You know, and, you know, the leadership piece. So as you're looking at the future, I love the analogy and the connection to historian, you know, just history in general. As a former history, as a history major, I appreciate it. And I understand that connection. Now, over the course, course of the pandemic, there's been this just remarkable digital transformation. Yes. An accelerated digital transformation, literally across the planet. How has this digital transformation played a role in helping to do what you're doing as a global futurist? I think there are a few aspects of that. Number one, the digital transformation was already in the works. And I think the, the pandemic sort of opened the floodgates for us and, and accelerated that transformation. And so I think a benefit for that is now we've got increased opportunities to include people who may or may not have been able to work in a particular location because now you can dial in from anywhere in the world. And so it really, I think, gives us an ability to tap into a global network of folks that we might not have been able to uh, be in such regular contact with. And a great example of that is what we were able to do during the pandemic on our team, which was create our Global Futures Report, where we developed four 2035 global scenarios of how post-pandemic competition might look from a geopolitical perspective. Um, and we did that all virtually. Uh, all of us were scattered from Hawaii to the Middle East, to Egypt, to Europe, to the East and West Coast of the United States. Uh, and we brought that team together and published it in six weeks, which I think is a record six time. Weeks because we wanted to make sure that Incredible. we could get that out to the leadership, so yes. And so tell us a little bit about, if you can, the process in creating that report. Look, the future is difficult to predict, but if you can't model it out and model out potential scenarios, you run the risk of falling behind in some way or being blindsided. So how did you pull all that together? Absolutely. So one of the sort of the maxims that we live by is that the future doesn't exist. There are many possible futures and all of those futures are constantly in flux. And so what we're trying to do is not necessarily predict the future or be right. Um, we're trying to understand how we can challenge our assumptions from today, the status quo, how it might not uh, play out in the future. And would we be prepared, for example, in the military, would our force structure be prepared? for a range of possible scenarios. Just like banks in the private sector do stress tests for liquidity. Um, it's a similar type of process that we would use called strategic foresight. And so what platforms did you utilize for this report? I know it's a virtual reality platform, but how does it, you know, what is it built on? I know you had mentioned 
uh, different types of platforms and companies? And then what is it, what, how intense is it in terms of the, the ability to create this virtual world? Well, so there are two assets to it. One is the, is the, the first report that came out in June, uh, which is sort of the basis for the content. And then we took it to the next level by publishing the first ever virtual reality futures report that you first mentioned. Ever. First ever. It's the first time that, we've, wow. that there's been a, a report with uh, future scenarios put into virtual reality uh, for uh, a military service. So when you and say so, that, when you say in virtual reality, you're actually wearing the yes. virtual reality heads to HoloLens? Yeah, so it's so it, we, in this case, you know, we're using Oculus. Oculus. Uh, but I mean, this the the, the sort of the platform really is, um, you know, not not the main feature of it. It's the uh, you know the content and the, the fact content. that we're able to bring together uh, those scenarios in this immersive experience that really lets the audience, lets decision makers Incredible. step into that world, and so it changes the way people consume information and how leaders will make decisions in the future. Well, and and I would imagine. Uh, you know, we, we speak daily to global leaders and luminaries like yourself. And what we find is that the most prepared leaders have access to data and information. And they can see trends. And that's what we're talking about with global foresight, right? Strategic foresight is the ability to model out different scenarios. It, it is. And it's the ability to sort of understand which signals, which weak signals present in the current environment today uh, are we missing? And those weak signals together start forming trends, and then we start doing sort of a visual a visualization of all those emerging trends. We can start building out scenarios and understanding what we might be missing. I think that's the value proposition. Yeah, what exactly. are what are we not seeing? And I'm trying to understand. I know you mentioned Hawaii. I yeah. want to go back to the University of Hawaii because I wasn't aware that it is one of the, or if not the, center for strategic foresight. Why is that? Uh, it really has to do with uh, with Dr. Jim Dater, who okay. is regarded uh, widely as the father of future studies, okay. uh, who uh, founded the Research Center for Future Studies out in Hawaii. And he's really just an internationally uh, recognized leader in the field of, of future studies and futurism. Um, and a lot of his work, uh, we actually used his, his methodology when we built our futures report. Uh, so that's called the Manoa School of Futures uh, from Incredible. the University of Hawaii. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. And so I, I want to take it a step further. So you built the report. You've shared some sort of insights on how it all came together. What are some examples of what came out of that report? What's in that report? Absolutely. So the report has four global scenarios of what the world could look like in 2035 using weak signals from today's environment. So we look at you know, what would a, a global collapse look like? What would a systemic transformation look like? A continued growth? Uh, and a discipline scenario. How would those all play out? But then we also do something that's called horizon scanning. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, basically looking quite literally across the global horizon to see which trends are emerging. So we looked at items uh, such as competition in space, competition in um, uh, geopolitical areas such as China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the European oh, wow. Union, transatlantic relations, the Middle East, but then also supply chains, National security supply chains, which became a household world, a household term, you know, this last year. Sure. Uh, but also disinformation, malign influence campaigns. So there's something in there for everybody. It's you know, it's awe-inspiring. You know, you're sitting, you've got line of sight, a very unique line of sight. You're leading this effort up for the United States Air Force. No small task. How do you wake up in the morning and say, "My gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna model out the future"? You said the future does not exist, but you're creating these scenarios. Are you confident that you're catching all of these scenarios? Well, I would say, George, that again, what we're trying to do is, it's we're not trying to be right, um, but what we're trying to do is say, um, when we're talking about something as 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 important and critical as our national security, um, how can we use this methodology? to make our strategic planning better, more effective? How do we avoid the mistakes of the past? And ultimately, how do we build our aspirational futures? What do we want the future to look like? Because ultimately, that comes from building and strategically planning things uh, so that you can actually arrive where you want to. And this summit, where this is broadcast as well, is focused on AI, cloud Absolutely. AI and innovation everything that you're working on. How does AI come into play 
with everything that you're doing. And and do you have concerns? Are you excited? I mean, what's your what's what's the pulse of the Air Force right now on AI? Where are we on this thing? I mean, you know, I think there's just an immense amount of excitement at the um, at the potential that sure. is going to be un unleashed. I think not only in this time period we're living, but moving into the future. Um, and what that's going to do, I think the kind of questions that we want to think about are um, what kinds of skill sets do we need to develop in the future? Um, what kinds of human capital investments do we need to make uh, in order to make sure that we're leveraging that human machine teaming um, so that we're all, you know, a lot of the technologies that we talk about that we want to leverage in the future aren't programmed yet. Right. So there's there's the piece of uh, the technology, obviously moving faster, which it normally does than the government bureaucracy. Sure. So there are those pieces. Right. How do you right. how do you put all of those uh, elements together? Um, but ultimately, I mean, this is an important race that uh, the United States needs to win. Uh, the United States needs to uh, emerge. And I believe that it will as the global leader in artificial intelligence. And I think we're all just scratching the surface right now. You know, that's that's incredible. And it's incredible to hear from you within the context of what we're talking about today. And that leads us to, do you believe the U.S. is leading in predicting futures? And if you do, why? So I really, I do. I, I believe that, and again, as I say, we're, we're not necessarily predicting the future, but I think that we're leading in strategic foresight. And I think we're living a renaissance of strategic mm -hmm. foresight. And I think that's one positive aspect of the pandemic is that we've all been given sort of a mental reboot where we can understand how the future can truly change in an instant. And right. during that crisis, during that moment is the wrong time to start thinking about the future. And so what we want to do is always have a team, a capability of, of qualified individuals who can bring this to the table and constantly question the status quo, constantly challenge our assumptions so that we can make sure that we future proof our strategic yeah. plans moving forward. That's right, and I, and I think our global global audience understands. I mean, we in 2020 January, we're looking at this road, this pathway to 2030, to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, those 17 global goals agreed upon unanimously by every country, including the United States. And suddenly, we have this pandemic upon us, and the world changed in an instant. And yet, the United States Air Force and your role in the Strategic Futures, Air Force Futures uh, component of the U.S. Air Force remain the same. And at the same time, it sounds like you accelerated your planning and scenarios for the future during that time. Absolutely. How do you see the world being permanently changed by what we've just endured? I think a few things, George. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think. Uh, there's just a different appetite for accepting how, how different the future can be. Right. And because we've gone through a societal transformation in every single respect, from our educational system, from our healthcare system, from national security, the tech sector, I mean, every facet of our society has been profoundly affected. So I think that we need to take the good lessons that we've learned from the pandemic, and there are many, and move forward with those as we build our aspirational futures for the kind of world we want to live in, for the kind of country we want to build, and ultimately what our military can do to support those national strategic objectives. So are you confident that we will be in a situation where we reimagine instead of simply rebuilding? It's a broader question, but it's one that I'd like to ask you know, on, on, on many levels. I, I certainly hope so. And I think that we, we need to constantly be reimagining not only the status quo, current paradigms, but as we think about something like aspirational futures, um, how do we build the society that we want to live in? What does that look like? Um, what kind of what, what what are the implications for the international political system? All of these things we're living in this time of really rapid dynamic change, and so we, we need to find a way of staying ahead of the curve instead of being reactive. You know, and and that 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 is exactly the point is that we need to be proactive instead of reactive, and I love that analogy because. You have a current role that AI and innovation plays, you know, a big part in. And today, those two things, AI and innovation, are central to just about everything we're doing, and becoming more so each and every day. From someone who was working daily, 24 hours a day, right? You're working 24 hours a day. We know that. Who's working 24 hours a day to predict 
to model out the future scenarios, to protect the United States of America in this case, no small task. Can you share with our audience what can we expect in the coming years? Well, I think what we would look at moving forward uh, you know, are a few things. Um, we've seen, I think, an acceleration of, as we mentioned before, the digital transformation, which is only going to become more rapid and more palpable uh, as we move forward. But I think what we've also seen is uh, a new kind of connectivity. And I don't mean digital, I mean a human connectivity, mm -hmm. where we've been able to interact with individuals all over the globe um, through what we've been doing in terms of Zoom meetings yeah. and all sorts of right, virtual communications. But when we, we talk about things like the metaverse, right, things like you know, sending your avatar to a meeting right, and having that kind of, um, of technological breakthrough where right now we see that sort of few and far between where that's going to become the norm, uh, I think it, it just gives us so many possibilities uh, to, to really be a force multiplier right, on so many right. levels. Right. And uh, so I find it just, just so exciting to see the how these technologies will be implemented in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I mean, if you look out there now, we're seeing, uh, you know, virtual reality being used to, uh, you know, enable people shopping, right? I mean, where you can actually have virtual reality. So, and imagine the applications for the military or for the State Department in terms of stepping into another country without leaving Washington D.C. Yeah. Right. The kinds of training opportunities that you would have. Uh, it's really phenomenal. I, you know, I'm not often speechless. I'm speechless at that. And, and so, what do you see as that lasting change for you? For you, what has changed for the better as a result of the pandemic? What has changed in terms of something that you reimagine that you're now going to implement that will make what you do each and every day a force multiplier? I think the best thing that we've taken away from this pandemic, and the best gift, if you will, that we could pass on to our colleagues is to make futures thinking part and parcel of our day-to-day -day culture. So today, the inclination for all of us is we want a smartphone app. We don't want the smartphone app. We want the operating system. So we want an operating system, a cognitive operating system that's constantly in the background, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that it's operating so naturally that we don't even know it's there. That's what we want to shift, that, that shift in, in futures thinking is our way ahead. It's just mind blowing. It's, it's absolutely mind blowing. And I think that what you've shared with our global audience today is simply profound. I want to end where I started, which is to say thank you. Thank you for several things. Thank you for all the work you're doing to keep us safe here in the United States of America. Thank you for your work looking at the planet and helping to keep the planet cohesive. And thank you for helping shape our future which we are all hopeful will be a better future than we've had in the past with the pandemic now, thankfully, hopefully coming to an end. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your service. How can folks find out more about your work at Air Force Futures? So they, there's a few options. Uh, number one, now there's a lot out there on LinkedIn at jake.satiriatus at LinkedIn, where we're sharing all sorts of content on the report. Uh, and then they can uh, actually access our report at www. Afwic, A F W I C dot A F dot mil. The report is there. It's been downloaded, I think, thousands and thousands of times now. So if they want to take a look, there's something there for everybody. That's the last word. Please download that report. I'm sure you'll be as inspired as we are today. Jake Saturiatis, Chief of Strategic Foresight at Air Force Futures. Thank you. Thanks, George. Appreciate it.